Sunday Seminary Online. My name is Brennan Breed, uh, looking a bit disheveled. I need to get my hair cut. Um, but uh, I'm joining you here for the last of our uh, sessions on the prophets of the exile. So far, this uh, over the course of a few months, we've covered uh, the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and now we're working through 2nd Isaiah. And of course, the book of Isaiah demands more time. Uh, it rewards uh, a much deeper study than I'm giving it here. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I'll try to guide you through a little bit of uh, Second Isaiah uh, and, and lead us into Third Isaiah and end with a little bit of a reflection on Jesus and these prophets of uh, the exile. Uh, this part of Isaiah is so famous, Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, uh, full of some of the most beautiful poetry in the Bible and indeed, I think, in the history of the world. Uh, so it rewards great study. Um, I'm going to pick up where I left off last time uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, where we're, we were talking about uh, the the this scene where God is speaking to angels or prophets or a kind of combination of angels and prophets and giving the message that the, the time is done. The time of the exile has passed. Um, pe the people are still in Babylon, still in exile, um, but God is, is declaring that the time is about to happen where the people are going to go home and God is going to build this desert highway to get them home quickly. Now remember, this is the beginning of 2nd Isaiah. We talked about how there's three parts to the book of Isaiah. Chapters 1 through 39 reflect the time and the career of Isaiah ben Amos or Isaiah of Jerusalem, who lived right around the years 750 to 700 um, BC uh, or 8th century BC. Uh, and he lived in the city of Jerusalem and uh, his life reflected the, the crisis presented by the Assyrian Empire's attack on Israel and Judah. Uh, then we have this gap after chapter 39. Um, it's a gap that foreshadows uh, the, the kind of transition to the time of the exile and the time beyond, but it still reflects the moment in 701 BC when King Hezekiah is talking to Isaiah. Uh, and then we have this skip to chapter 40, which reflects sometime around the year 539, 540 BC. So we skip like 150 years. Um, uh, but, uh, well, more, yeah, yeah around there. Uh, but in any event, uh, this, this is a, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a gap that needs to be, uh, people reading this in the ancient world would have known instantly, oh, we're talking about Babylon, we're talking about the exile, we're talking about coming home from the exile. Um, this would have not taken a lot of work uh, for people in the ancient world um, who were immersed in and lived the the story of ancient Israel and Judah, uh, they would have just known this immediately. But for us who are removed from the story, at least in, in part, just by thousands of years, um, uh, this might not be so evident to us. But just between the end of chapter 39 and the beginning of chapter 40, there's this huge gap. And then between chapters 55 and 56, there's another gap. Uh, and this gap is, uh, the, chapters 56 and on presume that people have come back to the city of Jerusalem and that it's been rebuilt, at least in a way. The temple is standing again. So this suggests that there's another part of the book of Isaiah that reflects uh, this the time of, of, the, of the return home and when Jerusalem has been rebuilt. Uh, you have to have a temple to have fights over who's allowed in the temple. Maybe you don't have to have the temple, but it just the way it's spoken, especially in chapter, say, 56, which will end, I'll look at that a bit uh, today, seems to presume a bit of that. But let's go back to chapter 40 and pick up where we left off last time. Uh, if you remember, uh, this idea that there's in the wilderness or through the wilderness, this road is going to be built that's going to bring the people directly home from Babylon to Judah through the wilderness, through the desert, a, a place that is inhospitable. Now, God has sustained the people in the wilderness before for 40 years with manna and so on. Um, and this is uh, uh, kind of hearkening back to those stories of God's miraculous provision and deliverance from oppression. Uh, so this is, you know, building on this, uh, this former story. Uh, and this is not something that's even new. This is not even the first time in the book of Isaiah that we've heard about a highway. Uh, in fact, first Isaiah or Isaiah of Jerusalem uh, in chapter 11 of Isaiah spoke about this. Uh, when the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrian Empire, when Samaria was destroyed by the Assyrian army, Assyria took the people and uh, in many of them and took them into something like exile, uh, really kind of spread them around um, among other peoples. Uh, this uh, uh, can, you can read about this story in the book of Kings. But if you look at Isaiah chapter 11, 
there's the really famous part of Isaiah chapter 11, the stump of Jesse. But after that, uh, say starting with verse 12, um, God says that the, uh, the prophet Isaiah tells us that God says that God is going to return the people of Israel at some point, the northern kingdom of Israel who've been taken and, and dis, uh, distributed. It's God's going to assemble these outcasts, right? So God's going to bring them home. So the idea that God's going to bring home the people from Babylon, um, this is hearkening back to uh, a message from 150 years earlier where the prophet Isaiah of Jerusalem said uh, God is going to bring the people home from being scattered around the Assyrian Empire. But if you look at verse 16, so uh, God is going to make a highway from Assyria for the remnant that is left of God's people, as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. So the Exodus, right? God made a way through the wilderness during the time of the Exodus, and God's going to make a highway from Assyria for the people to get home. So in Isaiah chapter 40, we hear about this highway that God's going to make. Uh, every valley, and you know, right, you know, make this highway, bring the people home quickly. Uh, this is something that we saw in in Isaiah of Jerusalem's career, right? In first Isaiah. So again, we can see that Isaiah chapters 40 through 55 are reflecting a very different time uh, than the time of the prophet Isaiah. But they're also deeply connected to, uh, to, this, to, to the proclamations that Isaiah made. And uh, this is connected to this. If you look at verse 8 of chapter 40 of Isaiah, if we go back to chapter 40, um, this idea of a highway, the, this is a message that, that's being spoken to the people. Uh, verse 6, of voices cry out. And then I said, well, what am I supposed to cry? The, the, the people are, are, don't have any consistency. The people don't, don't have any strong faith. They don't have deep roots. They're like weeds that are dry up if there's a drought, right? The people, you know, the flowers that fade and they wither and so on. But then uh, the people are grass. But then verse 8 kind of responds to that and says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So the word of our God will stand forever. The word of the Lord never fails. The word of the Lord keeps going. Uh, this is this is what I, I, Second Isaiah is showing us. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40 is telling us that... Uh, uh, the words that were spoken by the prophet Isaiah 150 years earlier, they were written down because the prophet Isaiah said many things that were miraculous and became true. And, for example, the city of Jerusalem was under siege twice during the career of Isaiah of Jerusalem, and both times uh, it was an army that was far greater than, than Judah had. Uh, Jerusalem was going to fall, and miraculously on both occasions, Jerusalem managed to survive. And it was Isaiah of Jerusalem, and really almost no one else, it seems, who was saying, just trust. God's going to save the city. Don't worry. Trust. And he was right. Which So the idea is that the Lord's word was spoken then and it was true. It's going to continue to come true. It doesn't take away what it meant back in the year 701 BC, but instead it validates it. And uh, it's going to keep coming true. So keep looking for ways that God's word is going to, going to come true uh, in the future. And so Christians, when they're looking at uh, Jesus's life and Jesus's ministry, they're reading the book of Isaiah and they're not thinking this will do away with you know, it, it didn't mean what it meant back to back in, in those old days, right? Uh, 500 years ago, whatever it meant to those people coming home from the exile, that wasn't the, the true thing. It was it was only true when Jesus came, uh, when, when the book of Isaiah described Jesus. That's when it became fully true, and that ended any future conversation about what Isaiah means. Instead of that, the people who were uh, looking at Jesus' life and ministry and career used the word fulfilled not to mean that the book of Isaiah only ever talked about Jesus, but instead that it came true in the ancient world and it came true again and it came true again and it's going to come true again in other times and other places. So the word of our God will stand forever. This is what we might call a theology of the word, the word of God. Uh, this changes even as we read the book of Isaiah. Um, the word of God was primarily understood to be given through prophets. Prophets would receive the word of God. They would speak it to the people. People would write it down and then continue to kind of look for this word of God becoming active in their own communities, in their own, uh, in their own day and age, in their own contexts. But you can see with Isaiah chapters 1 through 39 being kind of reworked, rewritten, spoken again, spoken anew in a new context and, uh, and changed in a way that this is changing the way that people are thinking about the word of God. The identity of the prophet no longer matters in Isaiah chapters 40 all the way through the end of the book, through 66. Um, instead of uh, focusing on the career of an individual prophet and telling stories of that prophet, like Isaiah chapters 1 through 39, or like Jeremiah or Ezekiel, now we've got a shift to kind of an anonymous voice, 
that is reading and meditating on the words of a prophet that were written down a long time ago. This is a shift towards what we would call a religion of the text, uh, a religion of the book. Uh, this is a new and different way to engage God and to engage the Word of God, to engage God's presence in our community. Um, and this was a strange, strange thing in the ancient world. The ancient people would have thought this, and they did think, that this was a, a, almost insane, that Jews and later Christians uh, thought that God spoke to them through a book primarily, um, rather than through live prophets or through events in the stars and the skies and bird, the flight of birds and things like this, right, uh, omens. You know the Jews and then, and then later Christians uh, held this idea that um, that this this book and not just the book itself, but reading the book and interpreting it together in a community for our own day and age, the idea that God continues to speak through these old books in new ways. Um, this is a radical shift in the way that people understand uh, God's presence, God, the activity of of God in the world, uh, and it's. It's why I do what I do. This is this is this is what Bible study is, right? So uh, again, just to note that that's a, a radical shift. If you want to see more about this, the book of Nehemiah uh, has a story in it about Ezra, who comes back from exile and returns with this big book and reads this book so that everyone in Jerusalem can hear it and then it's not just that Ezra is reading the book and everyone has to hear it. It's that there's uh, there's uh, Levites, kind of lay people, who are, are trained, wandering around, helping people understand, kind of translating it into their everyday speech, and then talking about it with people. So the idea is that uh, the very first time that you have something like a reading of the Bible, which is kind of what Ezra is doing, uh, it's not the whole Bible, it's, you know, but he, he reads probably something like Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Torah. The very first time that you get a reading of the Torah in public, uh, it, it's not just like it means what it means. Um, people have to interpret it. People have to read it together in community and discuss it. Uh, and that's that's how it means. That's how it works. Uh, so another major shift that happens in Second Isaiah um, is uh, a, a transition in, in ancient Israelite theology. Uh, so ancient Israelites, um, they did not have firm claims to what we would call today monotheism. So monotheism means that there's only one God. Mono, one. Theism, you know, kind of ideas about God. There's only one God. That's monotheism. The claim that there is one and only one God and no other gods exist, no other gods have ever existed. Um, it's all only ever been one God. Uh, this is a, a strange claim uh, if you look at the ancient world. Almost all ancient people believe that there are lots of gods out there in the world. They might worship one god in particular, but they would recognize that there's lots of gods out there. So the Romans, right, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, the Iranians, the, you know, the ancient Persians, uh, the ancient uh, people of India. Um, they might have different ways of explaining this, describing this, and so on, but they have lots of, they, they would believe that there are lots of different kind of active gods. Um, they might all reflect kind of one one godhead or one force, one divine force, but they, they have different personalities, these different kinds of gods. Um, so this would have been the norm, right? This is the way that people believe. And ancient Israel seems to have believed this, at least in the very ancient world. Now, uh, remember, my one of my claims here is that God speaks to people in ways that they understand. So when God starts speaking to Abram and Sarah in the book of Genesis, they come from Mesopotamia. They come from Ur of the Chaldees. They're Babylonian people. Abram and Sarah are Mesopotamian people. They believe Mesopotamian things. They don't have some kind of special, like, full knowledge of God. They hear God's voice and they follow God, but God doesn't tell them, according to what we see, that God doesn't tell them everything, right? Uh, God says, follow me. Uh, and so there are these little hints uh, that there is only one God uh, in a lot of the Old Testament, but there aren't, like, full-throated claims, right? Even, even in the Ten Commandments, when God says, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall have no other gods before me, or really in my presence is one way to think about it. Only worship me is one way of saying this, but only worship me is not the same thing as saying there's only ever been one God and only ever will be one God. So biblical scholars say, okay, there's a difference here between monotheism, which is the belief that there's only ever been one God and only ever will be one God, and what we call uh, maybe monolatry. So so like idolatry, right? Um, the worship of, of an idea. Um, monolatry means the worship of one thing or one God. Mono, one, latry, worship. So monolatry means worship of one God. That seems to be what ancient Israel was told to do, worship one God. 
but it was kind of left vague about whether or not there are other gods that exist. In the book of Deuteronomy, God says to, uh, to, to Moses, well, you know, he kind of gave other peoples their gods. Now, does that mean that like there are other gods out there and so on? I mean, there's lots of, uh, it's just, it's left vague. Um, in other words, it wasn't like a, a firm, uh, you did, it wasn't a creedal belief in ancient Israel that you had to say there's one and only, other, and, and only one God. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, even first Isaiah, seems to be a, a, a bit of a change here. Um, the book of Isaiah, starting with the prophet Isaiah, who lives around the year 700 BC, there's this message that uh, the other gods are idols. Um, now, uh, idols, so you see here an image. Uh, this here is a, a carving, a, a statue of Ale, the high god of the Canaanite pantheon. Uh, there were also images or statues of Baal, images and statues of all the ancient gods. Uh, and they didn't believe that these, the ancient people didn't believe that these were actually the god or the body of the god or something. They knew this was a statue, a sculpture. They knew that someone carved this stuff. But what they believed was that they carved this this picture of a god and that they put it in the main space of the god, in the Holy of Holies, in the god's bedroom, in the temple of that god. And that they would pray over it and and christen it you know they would like pour oil over it right they would uh sanctify it and uh, if they believed that they did all this stuff correctly that the gods could like inhabit this this the body of this idol uh very easily so in other words it was a way to like offer the invisible gods a way to inhabit a, a thing an object and then you could venerate that object you could you know, worship the God through that object. Um, so it's more complicated than to say that like these ancient people think that this is their God, this like wood and stone and metal object that's carved, right? They didn't believe that. But the book of Isaiah seems to kind of uh, mock people, right? Uh, the book of Isaiah um, moves the discourse, the conversation about gods in ancient Israel from saying, uh, don't worship these other gods to saying these other gods are nothing more than statues that have been carved with people's hands. They, they don't exist. There's nothing bigger beyond them. So we're moving in a way from monolatry or worship of one God to monotheism, uh, the belief that there is and only ever will be one God. And the second Isaiah is this big, moves the ball forward uh, a long way. Uh, it's it's a, a massive shift. Uh, so you can see some of this like in chapter 40. It's chapter 40, verse 19, an idol. So like if you start with verse 18 even, um, to whom then will you liken God or what likeness compare with him? So what's God like? An idol, like a, an object, a thing that's made. And remember, ancient Israel is not supposed to have these carved objects that represent Yahweh. That was one thing that made them different. Um, but here we learn that it's not just because God doesn't like carved objects, um, but it's because those carved objects are nothing other than carved objects, uh, but we're investing them with all kinds of uh, powers and ideas and so on, um, and it, it's harmful to us. So an idol, a workman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, like this one here, and casts it for it silver chains. So in other words, you know, you kind of like keep it, you kind of like put it down on a, on a table or a chair or something like that, and you kind of like attach it. Um, you have to attach this thing or it falls over, right? That's not alive. As a gift, one chooses mulberry wood, wood that will not rot, and seeks out a skilled artisan to set up an image that will not topple. So these things fall over. Like, uh, remember that story in the book of Samuel, uh, in uh, the beginning of the of first Samuel, uh, the Ark narrative, the story of the Ark, and it's taken captive by the Philistine army in first uh, Samuel chapter four. Uh, and then it's taken to uh, the, the temple of Dagon, the god of wheat, the, the, one of the high gods of the Canaanite pantheon. Uh, and this, this, it's set up, this, you know, the, stat, the, the Ark of the Covenant is set up uh, opposite uh, the statue of Dagon. And of course, in the morning, the statue of Dagon is toppled. It's fallen over. So this is an old story that like uh, Yahweh is more powerful, the, the object that embodies Yahweh's presence, the Ark of the Covenant, the mobile Ark, right? is stronger than uh, these uh, the things that embody the presence of other gods. Um, but this is kind of moving beyond. It's saying there's nothing more than this. And in fact, uh, if you turn with me a little bit um, to chapter uh, 44, there's a story here, the absurdity of idol worship. So chapter 44, verses 9 through 20, you can see that uh, this is like a prose narrative, right? This seems to be a little bit different than some of the poetry around it. 
So it starts off, it's like a little sermon. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. So the idols are nothing, and they don't. there's nothing gained by any of this. It doesn't refer to anything. There's nothing beyond it, behind it. It's just an object. Their witnesses neither see nor know. There, there are, like, you know there's, there's nothing seeing behind it or beyond it. And so they will be put to shame. Who can fashion a god or cast an image that can do no good? These things, like they, they, they can't do anything. Look, all its devotees will be put to shame. The artisans too are merely human. Let them assemble, let them stand up. They should be terrified. They should be put to shame because the true God is going to come and judge them is the, the, what, you know, the, the what's unspoken there. The ironsmith fashions it, works it over the coals, shaping it with hammers and forging it with a strong arm. He becomes hungry. His strength fails and he drinks no water and is faint. So this is a little story. Guy's working on, you know, a metalsmith is working on this thing, crafting it. He gets thirsty, right? You're making metal over a fire and bending it and hammering it. And you get thirsty, right? So what does he do? He gets hungry and thirsty. The carpenter stretches a line, marks it out with a stylus, fashions it with planes, marks it with a compass. He makes it in human form, human beauty to be set up in a shrine so that we've shifted to this guy working with the wood. So there's the metal worker, there's the woodworker, right? And the woodworker is doing all this stuff. He cuts down cedars, verse 14, cuts down a home tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar. And so they're planting these trees. They're, they're cutting down these trees. Then it could be used as fuel. So part of it, this we've shifted to the to the, the um, woodworker here. Part of this tree, woodworker cuts down the tree. Part of it, he takes and warms himself. So he builds a fire out of part of it. He kindles a fire and he bakes bread out of it. Remember, we got the guy who's hungry. So you're you're cutting down a tree. Part of it you cut off and you make fire. You burn it for a fire and you break bread over it and you warm yourself. Then he makes a god and worships it with the other part makes it a carved image and bows down before it. So half of it, he's burning in a fire and over this half he roasts meat, eats it and is satisfied and he warms himself. He says, oh, I'm warm. I can feel the fire. But the rest of that same thing, he makes a God out of it, his idol. He bows down to it, worships it, prays to it, says, save me, you're my God. So again, this is not what ancient people actually thought. They didn't think they were making a God. They thought they were making a space, like an image, right? That was uh, a house for the deity's spirit, right? So the, 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 the ancient Canaanite people didn't think that was actually Ale, the high god. Uh, instead, they thought that was a space that was easily occupied by Ale, you know, sanctified, set aside for Ale to use as like a, a body form if Ale needs one. At the same time, uh, Isaiah is making, the second Isaiah, the, the anonymous prophet here, the poet, is making fun of these folk, right? Uh, and saying, like, pointing out the absurdity uh, that, that this this wood or whatever you know would actually be useful for something, but there's there's nothing you know you can use part of it for to burn for a fire and the other half of it you're going to make a space for a god out of. Now look, you can actually say the same thing about ancient Israel because they're using a piece of stone, right? Uh, and they're going to carve out part of it and use it you know as um, a wine making vat, and then they're going to use the other half of it as a stone to be part of their temple. But ancient Israel knows this. They admit this. They say this, right? They say that this building, like if you read 1 Kings 8, when Solomon builds the temple and then prays for it, he says, this building's amazing. It's wonderful. It's going to house God's presence. But at the same time, what can house God's presence? Right? Nothing can house God's presence. God's presence is bigger and stronger and, and greater than anything. Uh, God's up in heaven. And, and you know, so there's this um, uh, spoken uh criticism within ancient Israel's tradition about all of its objects, all of its religious objects. Um, and, and there's the, at the core this rejection of the idea of making an image of God. And I think part of that is that making an image of God means that you think you can kind of control God, ask God to be somewhere, you know. And the temple is uh, in a way a an invitation to this kind of idolatry. Uh, if you put all your hope in the fact that there is a temple in Jerusalem, um, and this is why God is here. The God of the, the world is going to be with us and protect us at all times. That can be abused, right? That theology can be abused quite easily. God's on our side. God loves us no matter what. We can do whatever we want. This is the exact same, same thing that Jeremiah was really upset about. If you remember D Jeremiah's temple sermon, Jeremiah chapter 7, he says, you know, you, you've used the fact that God chose this place and this people and that there's a temple here in Jerusalem that God's made some promises about. God, you, you've used that as, as a excuse, a way, a way for you to not have to do anything. So in other words, it's uh, easy to be idolatrous even if you're saying the right names, the right words, uh, or worshiping in the right place. Um, but this critique of idolatry uh, is radical, was radical in its time, and is still, I think, radical today for us to ask that question. 
what are we worshiping? Uh, and even if we are saying the right names, you know, in a Christian community, we would say Jesus is the right name. But you can call a lot of things Jesus. You can use that name and attach it to a lot of things. Or you can make an image of Jesus and invest it with a lot of uh, what you think that Jesus wants. Um, but really, it's what you want. And then you seek after that. Uh, that's that's the creation of an idol. Um, this is, uh, uh, Karl Barth has a great um, response to uh, kind of modern contemporary concerns about idolatry and so on. I won't get into that here, but uh, if you're interested, just uh, just Google Karl Barth, B-A-R-T-H, and idolatry. And uh, there'll be a little history of a guy named Feuerbach uh, who uh, uh, had, had a brilliant critique of idolatry uh, in modern religion. And then Bart turned it on its head. But in any event, uh, this is uh, a one, one of the major concerns of Second Isaiah. But another concern throughout uh, Isaiah chapters 40 through 55 is the issue of the suffering servant. So there are these servant songs several of them, starting in chapter 42, uh, in chapter 42, verse 1, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He won't cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He won't faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth, until the coastlands, like the ends of the earth, wait for his teaching. Uh, so this is the beginning of this um, this uh, character, the introduction of the character of, of a servant uh, who isn't drawing attention to himself, uh, is interested in bringing forth justice and, and in spreading knowledge of God to the ends of the earth. Um, uh, it sounds... Uh, like a positive thing here. Uh, but as we continue, this character of the servant comes back uh, in uh, in several different chapters. But uh, if you turn to chapter 52, uh, this is probably the most famous of the, the uh, suffering, suffering servant songs. <clears throat> you can see in chapters 50 and 51 as well. But here uh, in chapter 52, verse 13, there's a famous bit about the suffering servant. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Many people uh, who read this, many Christians who read this today, think it refers exclusively only to Jesus uh, as an individual person. And part of that um, is uh, comes from chapters 52 and 53, um, where this servant who has been said to be set aside for God's special purpose in the world, to bring justice to all of the nations and so on, uh, in verse, chapter 53, verse uh, 2, he grew up like a plant uh, out of the ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing. You know, he wasn't a beautiful person or uh, didn't look uh, extra special. Um, and then verses three and on, we get this story where this, this servant then begins to suffer. He was despised, rejected by others, a man of suffering, acquainted, uh, acquainted with the infirmity. Uh, he was despised. No one held him to any account. And then verse four, we get this uh, theological twist. Surely he has borne or carried our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we've all turned to our own way, and God has laid on him the iniquity of us all, everyone's sins. He was like a lamb, in verse 7, that was led to slaughter, oppressed and afflicted. And then verse 8, by a perversion of justice, he was taken away. So it was unjust what happened to him. And then he was stricken for the transgression of my people. And then verse 11, out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. So there's some sort of twist to this. Um, and then uh, verse 12, he bore the sin of many, made intercession for the transgressors. And just before that, he poured himself out to death. So this person was... Uh, said to be a transgressor, uh, was bore the afflictions of many, did not sin, but kind of took on the sin of many other people. Now, of course, a Christian reads this and says that sounds a lot like the story of Jesus, right? And early Christians thought this. I mean, Paul talks about this in uh, you know, Isaiah 53, but this is a, a very common way to think about Jesus. And the, and the, the, the crucifixion stories kind of um, subtly reference this many, many times over. Now, uh, there's an interesting question, though, uh, and that question is, uh, who is the servant? Is it only Jesus? And is it even only in one individual person? If you look at another one of the Suffering Servant songs, um, chapter 49, 
Verse 1, uh, listen to me, you coastlands, pay attention, you peoples from far away. So this has to do with kind of the ends of the earth. Um, this is a, a longstanding um, idea and, and theological conviction of Isaiah, uh, going all the way back to Isaiah ben Amos or Isaiah of Jerusalem. Um, if you read Isaiah chapter 2, the idea that God is going to save the whole earth. Um, this is something that's hinted at in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. It's hinted at in Exodus 19, but it's not like explained fully. Um, and then in Isaiah chapter 2, you get this idea that like God's salvation is going to affect the whole earth. It's not just Israel and Judah that get to share in this. Um, so in chapter 49, you get this continuation of Isaiah's, uh, you know, second Isaiah is picking up on the first, you know, the message in first Isaiah about uh, God's redemption for the ends of the earth. But then uh, the Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, God named me. This harkens back to Jeremiah a bit. Uh, God made my mouth like a sharp sword and so on. But then in verse 3, And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I shall be glorified. So this is, this, I mean, it's it's named. Like you, the servant is Israel, the people. And this makes a whole lot of sense, especially if you think about it, like Jerusalem, the people from Jerusalem. Um, during that time of the exile, right, they were taken away into exile. And they suffered. They suffered greatly. They lost everything that they had known. Their city was burned to the ground. The temple was destroyed. You know, everything that they put their trust in, everything that they uh, saw as markers of solidity, stability, even the promises that God gave them, promises to David and to, and to Jerusalem, that the, the, the Davidic kingship in Jerusalem would always be safe. And those promises blew apart. You know, what, what happened to those? We'll get to that in a minute. But all to say that this, uh, uh, this, this, this led to great suffering great instability and, and deep emotional pain. And the people who lived in through this suffering, uh, they, they were God's servant. I mean, Israel is often called God's servant. Um, servant meaning uh, someone who has dedicated their life, who, who worships God. I mean, the, the word for worship and the word for serve are the same thing, right? You can't serve two masters and, you know, so on. A lot, you know, the, worshiping in the ancient world doesn't mean just like singing, praying, going to a a liturgical service, right? You know, going to a service at a temple. That's not really what worship means. Worship, the word for worship is to serve, to serve God, to bow down, to to spend your life serving someone uh, or serving a God, right? So this is the same word used to mean to like serve a king, uh, to be a, a subject of a king. So you're, you're God's subject. You're, this, you're a servant. So one who identifies with God, worships God, uh, this person ha had to suffer. And this is said to be in chapter 49, Israel, named very clearly. But then also, there's another twist to this, because this, this is sometimes identified very clearly as the nation Israel, as the people of Israel. But sometimes it's very clearly identified as a person who's separate from Israel and who's been set aside to like bring Israel back. So in verse 5, now what the Lord says, this is chapter 49, just right after that bit where it's like, it's Israel who's the servant. Now the Lord says, who formed me in his womb to be the servant. Oh, this is Israel. But to bring Jacob back to him, Jacob is the name that's used to refer to the people of Israel. So how does Israel bring Israel back, right? And that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and God has become my strength. So this person in verse 6 is supposed to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as an light to the nations, and my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. How does that supposed to work? Because if Israel is Israel's savior, that doesn't, uh, you know, so this seems to be an individual person or a group that has been set aside. So is this the prophet? Is this um, referring to the prophet? Is this referring to people who've been faithful? This is oftentimes like a story in ancient Israel. Think about like the Elijah, Elisha stories, right? That um, when, when Elijah fights the prophets of Baal, Elijah's like, I'm all by myself. I'm all alone, right? The servants, there's not many people who follow God really. Um, and uh, most everyone has fallen to idolatry and so on. So there's a, there's a story of like a, the, the, the remnant, right? The few who been faithful, um, keeping the faith alive. Maybe that's it. It's a it's a bunch of servants, you know. So at the time that Second Isaiah writes this, so at the time Second Isaiah writes this, uh, it, it could have referred to that group of faithful people who are going to um, lead and guide Israel. Uh, and during and through the time of the exile, you know, who kept the faith alive? Uh, people like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and this anonymous prophet here. Um, or it could mean Israel itself. Um, it could mean the elite who were taken into exile, right? Uh, you know, this is kind of Ezekiel's theology. Um, it's not clear. Uh, and one of the things that I see is when something is, is um, not clear in the Bible, 
And when all the research that you do, like spending lots of time thinking about it, doesn't clarify it at all, maybe that's the point. Maybe this is supposed to be amorphous. Maybe there's supposed to be different ways that we can understand this. So Jesus isn't the only referent here. By referent, I mean like the only like person that you can, or or people that you can connect to the idea of the suffering servant. Um, so uh, this can be used for anyone or anything that seems to have suffered unduly, right? Uh, so thinking about it that way, um, a lot of times Christians read this, especially Isaiah 53, the sheep, you know, lamb led to the slaughter. Uh, this is, this is, you know, Jesus is taking on the iniquity of the sins of all of the people of the world. Um, and oftentimes they connect it to like a, a sacrifice, right? This is about a sacrifice. Um, and the sacrifice, the, the blood of the sacrifice takes away the sins, but it actually doesn't work that way uh, in ancient Israel. Uh, this, this, this lamb that is led to slaughter um, was uh, afflicted, stricken, carried the diseases, had bruises on it, this would not have been an acceptable sacrifice in ancient Israel. The, the lamb that was brought to a sacrifice in ancient Israel, according to Leviticus, had to be blameless, unblemished in any way. It couldn't be wounded. It couldn't be stricken. It couldn't be struck down. It couldn't have bruises on it. Um, uh, it and and the, the word that's used here for slaughter in Hebrew, in verse 7 of chapter 53 of Isaiah, this word that means slaughter doesn't mean ritual slack sacrifice. It means butcher. It's and it's not that that word for butchering an animal is not used when talking about an animal in Leviticus. Um, even if you are kind of butchering an animal, it's a different word that's used. The word to, the, to sacrifice is a different way of talking about killing an animal. Um, this is about an animal that was beaten up and abused and killed for no good reason. So in other words. Isaiah 53 doesn't seem to be talking about, uh, like, and this, it, uh, it's often been used in Christian circles to talk about a particular kind of theology called atonement theology. So God atones, the Jesus atones for the sins of the people. So in other words, people sin, God's keeping like a, a tally mark, a record mark in some way, uh, and Jesus' sacrifice, Jesus dies on my behalf, I deserve to die. Instead, uh, you know, Jesus dies on my behalf, and then God like counts that as, you know, clearing my slate, right? Um, the I don't want to say that's totally wrong. Uh, you you see some of this language in the New Testament. What I want to say is that there's lots of different ways in the New Testament to talk that are that, that the Bible itself provides to talk about the death and resurrection of Jesus, and a very small percentage of it sounds like this, like that kind of atonement theology where like God needs to be satisfied, like the God needs to hurt someone or something. And so then Jesus steps up and volunteers to take the punishment for us. Um, the reason that I say that this this is kind of taken over uh, Christian theology, at least Protestant Christian theology for many years, it's taken over in Catholic theology too, but you know, this kind of the idea that God is bloodthirsty and needs to, and God needs to kill to make up for sin. And so Jesus volunteers, uh, and that uh, you know Isaiah fifty three sounds a little bit like that, but actually, if you look closely, Isaiah fifty three doesn't say this, and in fact, much of the New Testament doesn't talk about Jesus's death in this way. And if you think about it carefully, it makes God sound pretty crazy, doesn't it? Like that God needs to kill someone. I mean, God's the king of the universe. God can do whatever God wants. God makes the rules, right? So maybe there's a way to read Isaiah fifty three and read the New Testament. And there's other atonement theology. There's other ways to think about what Jesus did on the cross, Jesus' death and resurrection. Maybe Jesus defeated death. Maybe Jesus defeated the forces of evil. Um, maybe, you know, Jesus uh, provided um, uh, kind of a message or a symbol uh, for, uh, for, for humans to show us what we're supposed to do or how we're supposed to live or that answering violence with violence doesn't work, you know, whatever. Um, but there's many, many different ways to understand uh, Jesus' death and resurrection. And Isaiah 53 doesn't tell us the satisfaction model very clearly um, because this person who is a lamb, you know, being spoken of in terms of a lamb, uh, it, it's a perversion of justice. Verse 8, you know, God is just. If God is if God is not just, then what is God, right? God is just. God does the right thing. But it's a perversion of justice that this person was taken away and killed. Um, and it's not a sacrifice it's a slaughter of a poor lamb that is being oppressed and afflicted 
and and it, you know is, is you know this this sounds bad you know this is a bad thing and so on then you can also see that like verse four struck down by god and afflicted so god is a part of this i mean this is you know this is tricky stuff theologically um but what it doesn't say is that like because this person suffered um now everything's okay for us in a way uh you can read this to say that like this is supposed to shock us this is supposed to surprise us and shock us and maybe make us look around and see, is there anyone who we are trying to punish in order to make ourselves whole? And let's not do that. Let's not pervert justice in this way. Um, let's not put uh, our, our sins on someone else. Um, it's possible uh, to read this to say that, uh, you know, God is a part of this, that God is uh, punishing Israel in a way. Um, but it's also understandable to see that uh, that this is asking deep questions about God and about God's role in all this. Now, this sounds tricky and complicated, and it it scares a lot of people, especially Christians. Just, it scares Christians to ask questions about God. But the Old Testament is very clear. Do you remember that part of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 15, where Jeremiah says to God, you're a liar. And God says, let's talk about that. Uh, and God renews promises to Jeremiah. Well, in the Psalms, if you take a look at any of what are called the lament psalms, psalms where people are crying out in pain and frustration to God, like Psalm 13, it starts off, how long do I have to sit here and wait for you, God? Didn't you say you were going to do good things to me? Well, why is nothing happening, right? I'm going to die out here. You better hurry up. You know, uh, the Old Testament models for us a kind of faith that is combative with God, that asks deep questions, that struggles with God, that demands things about God. And the prophets like Jeremiah, and like Isaiah, often put things into God's mouth and, you know, tell us that God says these things that, that say, I'm like, I'm sorry, or that ask, you know, like in Jeremiah where, where God's crying God's eyes out. Uh, in Isaiah 54, uh, God says, I'm going to give you a new covenant. And then look, verse 6, the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit. Uh, the, this idea that God is is marrying you. So chapter 54, verse 5, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. Uh, remember the covenant, the idea of a covenant was not common in the ancient world. It was really only something that Israel talked about. The idea that the people married a God, this is a very strange thing in the ancient world. Um, but the idea is that they made, a, they made a deal, a covenant. They made a, an agreement with God. That's what happened at Sinai. God says, here's the contract. And the people signed the contract. And then they spoke about it like a wedding, like a marriage. We, we agreed to these terms with you. Uh, and then the people of Israel, um, and you know, especially here in Isaiah, the people of Jerusalem, uh, in a way, they divorced God or left God or, or cheated on God, right? They acted and lived in a way that was unfaithful. They were unfaithful to God. And then God abandoned them because of the unfaithfulness. So verse six, for the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit. So this is saying God's gonna renew that promise. Now remember the book of Lamentations that I talked about last week, Lamentations accused God of abandonment. Uh, you know, maybe we didn't do the right thing. Lamentations doesn't say we did. We only did the right thing. It says we did the wrong thing over and over again. But still that doesn't make it okay for you to abandon your spouse. Um, you know, spousal abandonment uh, in the midst of your spouse going through a really difficult time, um, you know, isn't, isn't great. Uh, but, you know, instead of defending God or saying that God didn't do anything wrong, look at verse 7 of chapter 54 of Isaiah. For the, a brief moment, I abandoned you. God says, yeah, I did. Remember Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is a quotation from Psalm 22, you know, accusing God of abandonment. For a brief moment, God says, I did abandon you. But with great compassion, I will gather you. In overflowing wrath, for a moment, I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is a way that the word sorry doesn't exist in, in ancient Hebrew. This is about as close as you can get to saying, I'm really sorry. Yeah, I admit that I abandoned you. I hid my face from you. But now I'll change. You have, you have God changing here which is a crazy thing to say. And look, maybe like if you think about it in like a philosophical way, maybe God doesn't ever change, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But like, is that, is that healthy for us to, as human beings, limited to our minds and our experiences, 
Is it healthy for us to say God doesn't ever change? Or is it healthier for us to hear this, um, you know, humanized version of God, right? Where God says, I'm sorry, and I'm changing. I'm changing. You know, that's the way that the Bible speaks to us about God. Um, and maybe it's helpful for us to hear that in that way, spoken in that way. And then verse 10 this is kind of a beautiful thing. For the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love, my, my covenant love, my, my loyalty, my covenant loyalty shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. O oh, afflicted one, storm tossed and not comforted. I'm about to set, set your stones in antinomy and lay your foundation with sapphires. God's going to build a beautiful place for you, a beautiful new home, Jerusalem. So in any event, this uh, notion of the suffering servant, I don't think is answerable. There's not like a one, you know, there's not like one sentence that sums up what this thing means, but it, it gives us a conversation wherein we see, hey, sometimes people who suffer or communities who suffer, sometimes there are things that they deserve. Like, you know, like they, you know, if we... Uh, have problems with the climate because we burned a lot of carbon and put it in the atmosphere. We're like, you know, God's not going to just undo the laws of physics and, you know, biology, chemistry, just because like we get a do-over because God loves us, right? I mean, you know, there are consequences to our actions. And so sometimes there are these consequences. Um, that's, that's a part of Isaiah 52 and 53. Also, sometimes there's perversions of justice. People are scapegoated or blamed for things. Uh, and scapegoat, by the way, goes back to Leviticus, but the scapegoat is not the one that carries the sins. The scapegoat is the one that's sent out in the wilderness for an evil being to, to, to munch on. Uh, Azazel, whatever that is, it's not, not, not explained in the rest of the Bible. But all to say that the scapegoat is, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of abused. It's, 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 it's not part of uh, atonement. Um, so there's a way to think about that too. And then there's this conversation with God where there's this kind of an angry voice. God, you did this, this perversion of justice. And then God's response is, I, I ignored you, I abandoned you, and I'm sorry, and it won't happen again. Like I said, whether or not God actually does, did, you know, acts that way, that's one question. Another question is, does it help us to hear and see this conversation modeled where this honest discourse happens between people and God? Um, and it gives us tools to grapple with times of suffering, earned suffering, you know, suffering that we deserve, that we, that we laid on ourselves, suffering that we uh, don't deserve, that are, is laid on us by other people, suffering that we don't deserve, that's laid on us by God, maybe. And that's the thing that's spoken here in Isaiah 52, 53, 54. Um, some, some kind of theological firecrackers here, right? I mean, some things that are, that are um, pushing some buttons uh, I, that, uh, you know, in, in some theological ways, but uh, that, that give us tools, I think, to grapple with maybe even our own, our own moment here. Uh, so one other thing is um, I, uh, <laughs> there's, there's, again, a lot going on in Isaiah. Um, I mean, there's so much that I want to read to you and just kind of, but... With the the kind of tools that I've given you, there's um, uh, you know, you've, you've got enough to like read through here. Um, but in any event, uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about here is Isaiah uh, 55. Um, so the questions that might be asked, right, uh, if you're in exile, uh, God says, "Okay, come home. I'm going to rebuild Jerusalem for you." Uh, you might ask, "Hey, you promised this before in Second Samuel 7. You promised that Jerusalem would be." would survive and it would be a, a safe place for us and you promised that you'd be in the temple and you promised that david would and david's children would reign forever and those those promises were broken uh psalm 89 is an amazing psalm because the whole first half of it is just saying isn't it great all these promises that god made about david and jerusalem and so on halfway through the psalm and i imagine that it's not j just halfway through the psalm i imagine that like somebody added a second half to the psalm because it was so uh, painful, the, the the exile, the destruction of Jerusalem, and so on. The second half of the psalm says, you broke all of your promises. You destroyed all of uh, uh, the city of Jerusalem and you destroyed the Davidic king. What's going to happen now? What happens next? And it's a really important question. What, what happens next after all these promises are broken? Of course, the people broke their promises. People broke their contract. But What's the status of Jerusalem? What's the status of the people of, of, of Judah and Israel? What's the status of the Davidic king now? Well, what are we hoping? Now we're being brought back to our, our land, but what is our land? Who are we now? Uh, these are open questions, and they're answered actually in some different ways. Um, one of the most compelling ways uh, that anyone responds to these questions, these prophets, um, is in chapter 55 of Isaiah. Uh, 
the very last chapter of what we call Second Isaiah. So, ho, everyone who thirsts, you know, or, or listen up, everyone who's thirsty, come to the waters. You that have no money, come buy and eat. So free food, free water, only for people who are thirsty. So uh, who is this directed to? Anyone who thirsts, anyone who's thirsty, anyone who's hungry, and not just people who have food and, and you know uh, money. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Grace, right? Free stuff. <laughs> Life-sustaining food. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what's good. Delight yourselves in rich food. All right, here comes, well, what's this good stuff? Incline your ear, come to me, listen, listen, so that you may live. So stuff that's better than food and water. Like, you know what, if you're thirsty for the real good stuff of life, then listen up. I will make with you, and remember, who's the you? It's anybody who's hungry and thirsty. I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. That word steadfast, um, sure love, this, uh, this is you know, loving kindness is another way to say this, but really that word chesed in Hebrew means covenant loyalty, faithful, loyal love, um, covenant abiding love. Um, so the, the, my, my steadfast, sure covenant loyalty for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander of the peoples, but you shall call nations that you do not know and nations that you do not know shall run to you because of Yahweh, your God, the Holy One of Israel, for Yahweh has glorified you. Seek the Lord while the Lord may be found and so on. So everyone who hungers and thirsts for the good, they are being offered a covenant, the covenant with David. Now, if you think about... Uh, ancient Israel, there were two main covenants, there were other covenants, but two main ones, the Davidic covenant and the Mosaic covenant. The covenant with Moses is the, like the law, right? The Torah. And the covenant with Moses is conditional. If you do these things, God will be with you. And here's all the things you have to do, right? You have to take care of the needy, the poor, the orphans, the widows. You have to worship God. You have to not have idols, right? The Ten Commandments, right? You know, all these things. You have to, you know, be faithful to God to each other, to yourselves, to the community. Uh, the, the, that's the covenant with Moses. And the covenant with Moses uh, is oftentimes denigrated in Christian communities. But at the same time, Jesus says in Matthew, none of this stuff's going to go away, right? This is all the covenant's still in effect, right? No jot or tittle is going to fall away from the law, right? So all to say that like, uh, you know, it's not, it's, God didn't surpass the law in some way, right? Uh, the law is fulfilled through Jesus, but it doesn't mean it's ended or over or something like that. Uh, the point being, um, this conditional covenant is with all the people, the, the people, all the people who say yes, who want to join. In contrast to that is the Davidic covenant, which is about grace. God does this unbidden, right? You know, I mean, I should also say that the, the covenant with Sinai, the covenant with Moses, uh, that's, that's all grace too. The people didn't deserve it. They didn't earn it. God's giving the covenant out of thin air to a people who have been enslaved, who didn't do anything to earn this, right? God, it's free, unbidden. It's all grace. The law is grace. At the same time, the Davidic covenant is given to David and David's descendants, not all of them even, but just whoever's on the throne. So one person at a time gets the Davidic covenant, as opposed to all the people who get the Mosaic covenant. The Davidic covenant doesn't say you have to do certain things to earn it or keep it. It's unconditional. Uh, God reserves the right to uh, correct and admonish uh, the king, whoever the king is, but the king will continue to exist and God won't take away the, the kingdom or the land or uh, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it's going to be in perpetuity. Now, of course, we know it's not. This is what Psalm 89 is grappling with. Um, the whole exile exists because something went wrong, right? Uh, but here in Isaiah 55, God is extending this covenant that was reserved for David and David's descendants who reign on his throne an unconditional covenant of sure love, steadfast love that can't ever be taken away. God is extending that to everyone who's hungry and thirsty, who hungers and thirsts for God, anyone in the whole world. And they're going to call nations that they don't know and anyone can join. And it doesn't cost anything. It's pure grace. So we see here in Isaiah 55, 
a summons that sounds an awful lot like what Jesus is doing in the New Testament and what Christians imagined didn't happen in the Old Testament, except it did right here. Uh, and this, I think, is continuing. It's not, this isn't the first time you kind of hear this invitation. I mean, this sounds a lot like Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, where Abram and Sarah are said, are to, are, you know, the, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. The whole purpose of this is for uh, of all this stuff, uh, of all of everything that happens in the Bible, is, is for the blessing of the world. Um, but here it's made very clear that uh, uh, this is a, sh a shift, right? Um, that this is a democratization and opening up of the Davidic covenant to all peoples who hunger and thirst for righteousness and for God. Okay, so uh, if, if you want to continue to read uh, Third Isaiah, uh, which is written uh, 56 through 66, the last 10 chapters of the book there, those these seem to have been written in a different place and time. Even if you just look at uh, verse 56, chapter 56, the beginning of what we call Third Isaiah, um, thus says the Lord, maintain justice, do what's right, and so on. Um, then verse 3, do not let the foreigner join to the Lord, say that the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Do not let the eunuch say I'm just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me, hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and in my walls, that is the temple, a monument and name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord who are faithful and so on. Verse seven, these I will bring to my holy mountain, that is Zion, to the temple, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house. It shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Here we have a conversation and an argument, really, um, about who's allowed in the temple. Is it only people uh, whose bodies have no what's called blemishes uh, in, in Deuteronomy 23. Basically, no no one who has unusual genitals shall be allowed in the temple because the temple is only for pure people. And people with strange-looking genitals, they're not allowed in. Well, Isaiah 56 says that's not, that's, that's not the way God actually works. Don't let those eunuchs, the people who have uh, genitals or who have their sexuality there, um, uh, identity, their, their gender, we might say, right? A eunuch is a person who doesn't fit in the particular gender categories um, of the ancient world. And as Jesus says in the New Testament, there's all kinds of eunuchs. There's people who are born eunuchs, there are people who are made eunuchs, there are people who choose to be eunuchs, right? This is a broad, broad category, which means people who don't fit, who don't fit in the particular gender categories of the day, um, who don't fit in the categories of sexuality, who don't fit. If you don't fit, if your body doesn't fit, if your self doesn't fit, if your soul doesn't fit, if who you love doesn't fit, God says, don't anyone, don't you dare keep those folks from me. Don't you dare put up obstacles to keep them from coming into my presence, to keep, keep them from coming into my space, into my temple. This is my home. And even if they can't have children to continue their name on, which is the way that people understood continuing your name or continuing yourself as having children. If they can't have kids, and remember in Isaiah chapter 39, uh, Isaiah says, to Hezekiah, the king at the time. He says, well, future generations of your family are going to be made eunuchs because that's what happens to people when they're taken uh, into exile quite often. If they work in the court of a foreign king, they're made into eunuchs so that they aren't a threat to taking over the throne and trying to take over with their own lineage. Uh, so there were a lot of people who returned home from Babylon who had been made eunuchs. And uh, this must have been a big fight. Are you allowed in or not? Deuteronomy 23 says you can't come in because you look different. Uh, this, you know, Isaiah 56 says, don't you dare keep those people away from my house. And foreigners, right, defined largely, broadly, like people who stayed behind in the land, those were considered foreigners, it seems, by people who came back from exile. Um, people who had married other people in the meantime, people who had forgotten how to speak the ancient language, um, people who had uh, come back from exile and ended up in Jerusalem. Uh, there's a long fight in ancient Israel about who's allowed in who's like, you know, is it only the, the biological children of Abram um, and Sarah? But no, in fact, we see that there's always outsiders welcomed in uh, to the people. Uh, and right here, Isaiah, the third Isaiah, the, this anonymous prophet who's writing chapter 56, perhaps the same person who wrote uh, chapters 40 through 55, this person says, don't you dare keep those people away. If people want to be faithful and they want to serve God, then they're allowed in.
uh, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all peoples. Um, now, you know that Jesus is like, you know, loves this part of the book, right? Uh, so chapter 61, right? When Jesus wants to inaugurate his ministry, Jesus picks third Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord, God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, Jesus begins his ministry with this in Luke chapter 4, right? Uh, reading this because it summarizes, you know, what Jesus is all about. Um, what we might say here is that Jesus uh, sees himself as a prophet like 3rd Isaiah, 2nd Isaiah, 3rd Isaiah, uh, in part because uh, Jesus, the way he understands himself is that he's in the way the Gospels tell us that he's understanding himself, um, uh, is that he's come at a moment that is a lot like the exile. People who have been displaced and, uh, you know, the Roman Empire has been distending uh, the people. Uh, there's, uh, it's, it's become more and more difficult to live. Uh, it's been more, become more and more difficult to see where God is active, how God is at work among the people. There's a question about the future of the people. You know, what people feel oppressed and were in many ways. And Jesus says, uh, he, he reads these words, he says, this is fulfilled in your, in your, uh, you know, in, in your presence today. Um, this is fulfilled, you know, in me is what he's saying in Luke chapter four. Uh, but the point, you know, he says it's been filled in your hearing, but, but, the, but the point is, you know, I, this is me is what he's saying. That's why the people want to throw him off a cliff afterwards, because it's a lot to say, right? You know, I'm this guy. Um, but when Jesus says this is fulfilled today, it, he doesn't mean it didn't happen back then. Um, this this year was proclaimed way back when, and it meant something way back when, around the year 515 or so, um, with, for the people who had returned from exile. But now it becomes something new in Jesus' presence. And we still need this today. Uh, again, the idea that you know G Jesus doesn't do away with the message of these prophets because it happened in him. Instead, Jesus is asking us to pick up these scriptures and read them again today and ask the question, how is God active? How is God's spirit active around us? encouraging us to partake in the same mission that is so desperately needed around us today. So we see today, uh, I'm going to have to end here. Um, over the course of our study, we started with the prophets who were trying to help people deal with a breakdown, a severe breakdown of everything that they knew and they believed, they, they hoped in, that they trusted in, their identity, their, their location. Over the last year, we've gone through something a little bit like this, and I, I, it's to varying degrees. Some of, some, some of us have been displaced physically and um, emotionally. Um, this uh, process of the year of COVID has been something that uh, we, we can't just return to normal and forget that it happened. Uh, some of us have skated through it rather unharmed. Some of us um, have dealt with incredible loss and brokenness. Um, but for all of us, things have been displaced and have been changed. Um, and one way to think about this is thinking about these prophets that spoke the word of God in the midst of a time of crisis. Um, for us to think about how that message might resonate today. Where are we along the kind of trajectory of the exile? Uh, and uh, thinking about all the different messages that the prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, second Isaiah, um, have, have presented to us. Uh, and how can we embody the spirit of these, uh, of these prophets uh, in the midst of our own communities? One helpful way to think about it for me is to think about them as kind of um, the prophets aren't all saying exactly the same thing to the exact same people. They have differences. They have unique identities and visions and uh, you know, theological perspectives. Um, and think about them presenting toolkits. And so when you come across a new problem, you know, think, is this a, is this a problem that needs an Isaiah-shaped tool or a Jeremiah-shaped tool or an Ezekiel-shaped tool? Uh, what my the, my toolkit of theological tools, you know, my my theological um, reservoir of ideas, uh, you know, God has asked me to to study all of these because they provide opportunities for different situations, different contexts, and we are tasked with keeping our eyes and our ears open uh, and trying to understand all of the contexts uh, that we step into uh, to use wisdom to discern. Um, what message do they need to hear? Uh, and keeping this kind of, uh, these different tools at our fingertips, um, I think uh, provides us a way to, uh, to minister to people uh, in the midst of different types of crises. So I hope this has been in some ways a helpful 
uh, encouraging uh, trip, uh, obviously troubling too in some ways, but a, a reality-based trip, right? I mean, we've, we've not looked away from terrible things today and in the ancient world. Um, but at the same time, I hope that we can come out uh, seeing the gospel, not just as um, uh, you know, promises of hope, but as uh, statements of reality and statements of grief as well um, that that don't look away from the from the deep problems that we see around us. And in that way, uh, I hope we're empowered uh, to be agents of God's blessing and God's gospel. Uh, uh, as as uh, by the way, I think I didn't even say this in Isaiah. Uh, this is one of the beautiful parts of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter forty um, uses the word gospel or good news. And God says, O Zion, herald of good tidings, and this word here, good tidings, uh, good messages, good good news. Uh, and this is where the, the term gospel comes from. Euangelion, uh, good news, uh, is uh, the word that's used in Greek to translate this. And that's what's used in the, in the New Testament to talk about the message of good news, the salva- message of salvation that Jesus brings. O Zion, herald of the gospel, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of the gospel, lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Verse 11, God will feed God's flock like a shepherd. God will gather the lambs in God's arm, carry them in God's bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. May it be so. I'll see you in the fall uh, with a new series. Uh, If you have ideas about what to do for the new series, please feel free to get in touch, and I'll see you all. Have a wonderful summer. May God be with you.